situations where one or many of those variables change. Therein lies the problem. It's all of these uh, uh, monitors have the same advantage. It's convenient, it's easy to put in, or relatively easy to put in, rel relatively non-invasive. However, it, it could uh, produce errors when you have changes in peripheral vas uh, vascular resistance. That's one of the biggest problems. So um, any one of you who's done cardiac or doing cardiac would know what I'm talking about. You may have the radio art line in. When you're coming off pump, many of, time, many of the times you will find that your radio arterial uh, pressure is nothing like your aortic root pressure. That difference is due to systemic vascular resistance. It's been studied. People have used nitroglycerin to try and reverse that. Whatever the reason is, when you don't know what the cause is and you're in non-cardiac surgery, you don't have the aortic root line, now you're guessing as to what you're seeing, is that real or not? The esophageal Doppler, we tried it as well. Um, I have to admit, when we first tried it, we tried it in a thoracic case. That was kind of foolish, because as soon as the surgeon changed the position of the patient in thoracotomy, all our Doppler measurements were right off because the position of the aorta to the Doppler beam and the thorax completely changed. But even in uh, laparoscopic robotic surgery, going into the steep trend my gosh, where is the, where is the true uh, Doppler beam uh, angle we should be? So the problem is when we change position. And we also have uh, situations where aortic diameter changes during surgery. And that's partly due to the compliance in the aorta changes. So the Doppler beam is different from TEE in the sense that you don't have a picture to tell you that you are lined up properly. You just have to rely on the Doppler and it produces some errors. Bioimpedance, as I sort of refer a little bit, it is a physics, uh, a mathematical uh, measurement of the physics of fluid in a certain area, and in this case, it's in the thorax, but we know that in the presence of pulmonary edema or changes in peripheral vascular resistance, uh, the fluid in the thorax may not be actually blood flow, and that's where the uh, discrepancy came in, and in fact, bioimpedance never really caught on because very early on, people already noticed that it just was not that accurate. Um, we also, then went to the next level, uh, bioreactants and electrical velocimetry. Velocimetry is the second derivative using uh, bioimpedance. And again, people, some people say it's accurate, some people say it's not accurate, but uh, I would refer you to Critchley's article uh, uh, in, in uh, 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 in the um, anesthesia and orgesia, uh, and basically they found that when you have extreme, uh, extreme um, uh, height uh, and in, in uh, female, as well as in situations where you have high cardiac output or low cardiac output, it's not accurate. Uh, the bioreactance is looking at the phase shift in the voltage of bioimpedance as, as it changes and again, same sort of errors that occur. However, uh, more and more people are now looking at trending. Is it a good thing to look at the trend of these monitors? Not the absolute number, but the trend. If the trend starts to show a change, maybe that's when you should go by the trend, and if it's concerning, maybe you should go to the next level of TEE or some other means of monitoring uh, um, more precisely what is going on. And all of you know this, I just very briefly remind you, when we talk about volume, we're only talking about the preload, it's the Frank Starling curve, you give volume when it's low and then you start to see a fluid response when you move the volume up the Frank Starling curve. Well, except the Frank Starling curve changes 
when there's increased contractility due to sympathetic stimulation, so the curve shifts, uh, not along the, the uh, preload curve, but it shifts to a different family of curves. And then on top of that, guess what? The systemic vascular resistance changes also how your Frank Starling curve responds. We all know that. This is all from our basic physiology, early university or medical school. And this is kind of the graph that you would expect to see. So when you're just monitoring the cardiac output without knowing the context of where this is coming from, you may think it's a very simple little um, indicator that you can just rely on. But it really means that you have to decipher all of these little things that change your Frank Starling curve. On top of that, we all know that uh, determinants of cardiac output are multiple factors. Heart rate, we can tell. We can tell from the ECG how the heart rate is changing. The preload, we can use maybe the Frank Starling curve. Uh, the afterload, well, we don't always know. And we know that if the patient bleeds and you're hypovolemic, we start to see the pulse contour change. That's how the uh, stroke volume variability started to come in as an indicator. Contractility, we have myocardial ischemia, we have systolic dysfunction or failure, we have diastolic dysfunction or failure. None of that is measured. It, when you see a drop in cardiac output, you have to try and decipher what actually is causing that. We also have pulmonary hypertension, we have valvular diseases. So a number of things, variables in there that we have to decipher. So I will give you a case, a 46-year-old man for uh, obstructive sleep apnea and hypertension for septoplasty. Not a big deal. Episodic shortness of breath with moderate exercise. Well, I can vouch for that uh, every day if I try to run up the stairs. Uh, no previous general anesthetic, no medication allergies, and uh, the only thing was the atenolol for the hypertension. Examination unremarkable. BMI was 43. After induction, BP dropped to 65 over 30, and BP continued to drop despite ephedrine in increments. And the anesthesiologist decided to use epinephrine, 50 mics, heart rate 102, no BP improvement, TE then was done. This was a case report in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. I've given you the reference. You can actually look at it yourself. And can I have... Uh, video number one. So I'm going to shout. If you look very carefully, there's a lump in the in the LV septum. There's a lump right there. And can I have video number two? So this is zoomed in on the echo, and you can see the lump. And if you are quick with your echo skills, you even see a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. This patient has an undiagnosed hokum. And by giving ephedrine, I guess, first of all, the patient was induced, became hypo hypovolemic. Given ephedrine, increased contractility, the hokum got worse. Then the patient was given epinephrine, even worse. We wouldn't have known what was going on. Fortunately, it wasn't my case, uh, believe me. <laughs> but we, uh, the anesthesiology was really sweating because the patient was crashing. And we, we couldn't diagnose what was going on until the TG was put in. Completely undiagnosed pre-op. Uh, thank you. I'll go back to the slides. You can stop the uh, video. Thank you. So really what we're talking about is in uh, perioptic fluid management, there are a lot of principles starting to come out, and they are really very good principles. Um, when I was a resident, even when I was a, a staff consultant, oligure intraoperatively was something you treat. You really try to load the volume. Well, now it's not in favor anymore. Uh, 
when we see stroke volume, volume variation about 13% right after induction, well, it may not be, uh, it may not be hypovolemia. And I just showed you, in fact, in, in the case, it was hokum. I think I pressed the wrong button or something happened. <laughs> That's okay. So now we have a more balanced approach, and um, it is important to remember that NICE guidelines actually did have some qualifications. It said that in moderate to high risk patients, when you are in fact looking at putting in a central line, that's when you should be using continuous cardiac output. It does not say that every patient you should be monitoring cardiac output. And this was a nice uh, little article by uh, Timothy Miller. He also put an article in uh, perioperative medicine. Uh, both of these articles, if you are looking at fluid management, I think it gives a reasonable summation of where our current state of understanding is. And essentially, in the left uh, lower corner, it says low risk patient, you, you just use, use your clinical management. And a lot of people would say that this is the zero balance fluid management situation, meaning you don't use a formula and say that this patient must get so much volume for third space loss. You see what is lost, what you see what is sucked out, you replace that. That's it. That's your zero fluid balance. And then if you have uh, higher risk in terms of surgery or higher risk in terms of uh, the patient, then you start to use the go-directed fluid therapy. And in that case, the goal-directed fluid therapy is not to drive the oxygen deli delivery content, which is the goal-directed therapy, another term that was used in ICU or that is used in ICU. This goal-directed fluid therapy is just to see how much of a response in the presence of hypotension can you get with uh, fluid loading. And you can measure that potentially clinically or using cardiac output monitor, such as the stroke volume variability, which is the pulse contour monitor. And then in very high risk, um, both in terms of surgery and the patient, then you would, uh, you would uh, definitely use ghost directed therapy. And I would actually add to that, that's where you probably should be looking at a TEE or transthoracic echo if it's uh, under regional anesthesia. So in essence, we are talking about a risk stratified approach to fluid management. One size does not fit all, and guess what? It comes back to the person who is managing uh, the anesthetic has to think through what is going on and watch the suction bottle, watch the drapes, watch the peritoneal cavity if it's an abdominal surgery, because if you have a patient with ascites, that's a different management plan than a patient with a laparoscopic MIS surgery for the same procedure. Time. This is my summation. For every complex problem, there's always a simple solution that is wrong. If you're looking for a simple cardiac output to tell you everything, we don't have one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will share my experience with you uh, with, with the way we are treating PPH, especially massive bleeding in a maternity hospital. And the few changes that we had made so as to at least save our patient as much as possible. And probably we are the first uh, hospital we are using the Clotifact. We will go over also our experience. It, was a, it is a short experience of around one year of using Clotifact fibrinogen concentrate in our patient. So if we want to talk about PPH, we know that PPH by definition is a primary or secondary, and it depends on the amount of blood you are losing. Roughly speaking, we are talking about around 500 to start with ML lost by the patients, and this is if lost within the first 24 hours, we call it primary. And if it is lost within the 24, uh, 24 up to six weeks, this is what we call secondary. And also we categorize the PPH according to the, to the uh, type, whether it's mild and moderate. And what is important in case when you want to put a strategy is to identify your patients, is to identify your patient whom you think you, they are moderate to, uh, to, uh, uh, 
to major uh, bleeding, they have PPH bleeding. Even the minor bleeding, you need to identify them because in certain conditions they can immediately, or if they are neglected in a way, they can cause, uh, can be one of the major mortality and morbidity for the patients. You, you cannot identify this? Well, it is considered as from the... Okay, good. This is my name. <laughs> okay, okay. Then you can skip the first three slides. So today I will be talking about the experience that we are doing in maternity hospital, and we feel it's, it's kind of a... a, a we are happy with our experience because the, the, uh, the outcome is, is really uh, encouraging. <clears throat> okay. So the agenda that I will be going over, in, uh, because I thought it's a 25 minutes and it turned to be 20 minutes. So, and now the delay that happened, but don't worry. I can skip many slides, <laughs> okay. So my agenda will be uh, just, we've, we've, we talked about the definition, the pregnancy, uh, the, the female, the pregnant lady, could you skip? Skip please. Okay, the pregnant lady is well prepared to manage such a kind of bleeding because what happens is that there is an increase in the blood volume, there is a, a hypercoagulable state and the tourniquet effect of the uterine contraction. To talk briefly about the increase in the blood volume, Women in normal pregnancy, they have what is called as an induced hypervolemia, and this is an increase in the blood volume of around one to two liters. So three, around three, 30 to 60% there is an increase. And this is just to prepare her to, to tolerate such, a, when, when she has a bleeding, she can tolerate the loss of this one and two liter. So put on your mind, whenever she is losing one to two, still the vital signs is not changed. So it doesn't mean that whenever a patient is bleeding and the vital signs are uh, okay or stable, that the patient is not having a serious kind or impending kind of a serious bleeding. So this is what we see in the registry in the WHO. It was considered that hemorrhage was 25% of the, uh, sorry, this interruption. Uh, are you moving it or me? You are? With the WH, it, uh, hemorrhage is, uh, is responsible for the uh, underlying cause as an underlying causative. Go back, please. Hemorrhage is considered as an uh, underlying cause factor in around 25% of maternal death in industrialized and undeveloped countries. So since then, so many uh, guidelines and uh, like the, in the Royal College uh, guidelines and also some societies, they have implemented they have implemented some uh, detailed kind of uh, <laughs> Okay, so in the guideline they sometimes write for you Okay so beside the guidelines, some societies, they, have the put, put, they put kind of a detailed strategy for the way they want to treat their patient with, whenever they are faced with massive trans, uh, bleeding. And these policies are well written and well organized. Okay. So even when I went, because it was short time, only less than 48, I went over so many guidelines that were written, and there are so many of them, they were in the most of the obstetric societies. So we have a plenty of resources. But yet, obstetric hemorrhage is still a major problem, and it is, we have one mother dies every two minutes, and still, the, the, as a risk factor, it is still there. This is an old, because of short time, I didn't update it, but this is a very nice uh, slide to refer to. This is a, a UK registry when, uh, done through uh, between 2003 to 2005, where they have found that uh, hemorrhage is, 
where they have that it is, was the third highest cause of mortality in, uh, in maternal death. Not only that, the problem, the, 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 this registry, the, the reports of this registry was very important because they also noticed an even near, near miss audit that was one of the major causes of death. And they, they have published that even in UK, the majority of maternal death due to hemorrhage must be considered preventable. So around 60% of, of these case, cases were categorized as a major substandard care. So whenever PPH uh, 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 happen in the hospital, in theater, or anywhere, we have a very well-dedicated team. They, all of them, they are well-trained, well-experienced uh, in how to deal with it. Yet we are so uh, frustrated with that sometimes with the outcome of the patient. And this is probably because this is quoted in one of the journals. They said most of these cases, maternal death, occurs in spite of women delivering in hospital staffed by physician, nurses, and support personnel who are knowledgeable, highly motivated, and well-trained. And often these cases occur in hospitals that have very well-written obstetric hemorrhage protocol in place. So what, what is killing our patients? Probably this one of the articles that face the problem uh, truly. It is, it is, it was, uh, they, they mentioned it frankly, there is no consensus in the treatment of those patients, especially with the transfusion. Nobody can give you and tell you, give this amount, give that time, at proper timing, proper dose. That this, you have to, it's a subjective, you have to study it and see the patient. One patient is quite different than the other. And this is a true, the inconsensus, you can see it. If you review, go ahead, just flip them. These are, I put just some articles. Articles they are pushing you, use FFP, use blood, use a tag. Other would say no, stop, use that. So there are controversy in the, in the whole uh, journals and because they are trying to help. And some of them, they are with a very low quality kind of studies. Go ahead. Even some of this, although the majority they were pushing for FFP, still now there are articles, they are stopping, uh, standing against the use of FFP. They are claiming that it is one of the causes of multi-organ uh, failure in some of the cases. These are all collecting data. Some of the articles would say go for FFP, other would no, stop, because it has a side effect. So one, one of these articles, they mentioned, as if they said, we need a help in this article, because what did they said is that we should adopt a, there should be kind of a, a prospective clinical trials urgently needed. They need to review their process to apply a new one and to, uh, to uh, uh, abandon uh, an old kind of a treatment we are doing. They want kind of an evidence-based treatment and transfusion, and even they were discussing at the end that because there is a delay because of thawing the product, thawing, and this might add to some uh, risk, adding the risk of, to the patients. So what really kills the patient? To my point of view, there are two things that kills the patients. It's other factors related to the patient and factors uh, related to the delays. So I'll go first for the fa three factors that inside, uh, in the patients. These fact three factors, either the amount of blood loss or due to the rate of blood loss or the health status of women. We said that the patient acquired kind of a hypervolemia of one to two liter, but if the blood loss is more than 40%, this is kind of a life-threatening situation. If we go back to the rate of blood loss, a patient who bleed in a, in, a, in a rate of 150 per minute, this is a very high risk condition. Added to that, a health status of the patient. All of you, you know about the 40s that rela related to the postpartum hemorrhage. And today we are not going to talk about the different reason of the, uh, the different reasons it's related to the tone of the uterus, to the thrombus formation, tissue and trauma. So, uh, and we will not discuss all the reason, but we, the, this, the message from this slide is that, click please, is that you need, I know you know all of them, but you need to identify them early. Because once you identify all these causes that precipitate two major PPH, you at least solve part of the, question, part of the problem that is 50% of the problem. So what about the 50% the, the, the other 
The other, so the real issue during bleeding, acute bleeding, is that this is what we notice. This is my opinion because we've been, I've been involved in so many cases of PPH, and I was in the ICU monitoring, seeing how my colleagues working hard to save the patients. So all of us, we, we rush in taking the blood sample, but what happens to the blood sample or the, the, the tube, nobody notices it. Around 90% of, of the all engaged in the patient, they are busy with the patient to rescue. But I was watching it, it was left on the table for a time I consider it is responsible for a three delays. It's when, you, when this test tube doesn't reach the lab at, at the exact moment, at the time you need, then you would expose the patient to the delay of the diagnosis, delay and transfer the patient, and delay even in the treatment and proper management. So I think now we need to change policies and to implement a new strategies because this is a condition that with high mortality and morbidity, this is a condition with a high mortality and morbidity. We've been exhausting our resources because once the bleeding starts, we go into coagulopathy, DIC, خلاص, your, all your resources are exhausted. And at the same time, wasted effort from everybody. We want to avoid this of standard uh, care. And there are so many, if you know that there are so many causes are preventable, you want to reach to the standard that you prevent them to reach that preventable causes. Yes, please. Also, sometimes in a rush, sometimes the, 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 the whole issue is poorly uh, coordinated. Improper estimation of a quantitation of blood loss. I know the ICU, they have certain bags to estimate the blood loss, but always we ask, how, what is the bleeding, minor, major, or, or moderate? So it is a subjective, we don't have. And if we rely on the hemodynamic blood pressure or everything, you need to lose more than one liter to tell you the truth. So it is underestimating the problem. And this is, I will not go into the detail of it, but just to, this, uh, this uh, just focus that, we want to correlate the blood loss with the degree of change in the blood pressure as well as the symptoms. The patient, when she loses one, around 1,000, there is no changes in the BP or anything. It's just probably she's restless, palpitation, nothing. This is, can happen from anything. Can you go back, please? But you need only up to two liters or three liters that you have a marked uh, PP uh, derangement. Next. So if you, we need to change the policy because we want to prevent minor PPH to go into a very severe and jeopardize the patient uh, life. And for ourselves in maternity hospital, we need to review because our lab was quite far away from MOT and ICU. So if you want to change, uh, and you know, the whole process is not only traumatic to the patients and family, but also traumatic to us. So if you want to change, you need to predict. You, know, you need to know which patient I need to take care of them or I need to stratify them. And then you need to prepare yourself in a way that you can offer the best help and then to handle the problem properly. So this was our, our guide where we started our multidisciplinary pre, uh, uh, team, the aim of which is to, to, uh, to, to gather uh, all together and to reach into a successful and uh, uh, a proper management for the patient. So this was done through Back, please. This was through reinforcement of interdepartmental meeting and multidisciplinary teamwork for the higher.